Let's continue from where we left off designing the employee class. Recall that the big picture overview of the system stated that the software should support the ability to be able to hire or terminate employees. And it should be able to print an employee's detail report in either XML or CSV format. We concluded in the last lesson that we're definitely going to need an employee class, to say the least. So let's start from there. I'll show you a wrong class design first, and we'll go over the reason for why it's wrong, and then we can improve upon that afterwards. So take a look at this diagram. This is a UML class diagram with just one class called employee, but there can be several other classes in a diagram. The top section under the class name shows the attributes that are supposed to identify one object from another. We'll come back to those later. I want you to turn your attention to the section under the attributes which shows the methods defined in this class. Methods defined for an object should be thought of as behavior. The behavior an object is capable of conducting is representative of the object's responsibility. Look at the methods carefully. Do they seem to be behaviors of an employee? Let's think about what an employee does on a day-to-day -day basis. Employees can perform work or go on a lunch break and attend meetings, for example. These seem to be natural behaviors of employees. But the operations defined in this chart, in this class, don't seem to be behavior an employee would actually conduct. These methods seem like operations that can be performed on an employee rather than the employee objects performing these methods themselves. Do you see what's wrong here? This diagram, in a way, is showing that the employee object is responsible for saving him or herself to the database or printing their own details in reports or terminating themselves from the company. This should not be their responsibility. The problem with the design is that this employee class is responsible for way too much. And when classes stretch their scope of responsibility, things seem out of place, especially their behavior. This is true in the real world as well. For instance, imagine if a CEO of a company was responsible for expanding the business and attending important meetings, talking to board of directors, but then also took the responsibility for cleaning the company's bathrooms. That's an example of a poor design. That behavior is best delegated to a janitor class. So if we actually had a clean bathrooms method, it would belong in the janitor class, not on the, not on the CEO class. Sometimes it's hard to decide what behavior belongs in a software object because not all objects in software easily map to physical things in the real world. But there are cues you can look for in a class diagram to assess whether classes are designed well or poorly. You get much better at spotting these cues as we progress. Now, let's get back to the employee class for a minute. This object knows way too much. It enforces how it should be saved to the database, so it knows about the database details. It also forces its clients to use its report formatting for printing in XML or CSV. In a way, it's basically a stubborn little fella that's saying, use the behavior I have defined or don't use me at all. Can you imagine a large system where we have hundreds of different kind of objects. If each kind of object enforced its own rules about how it should be saved to the database and how its reports should be formatted, a requirement from the business to change databases or standardize reporting across the application would be a nightmare for programmers. Every class would need to be modified to change something as simple as an indentation in a report title. A system built with objects that have too much responsibility is a rigid and fragile design, and their behavior is misaligned from the intent that that class was actually created for in the first place. 
This leads us to our first object-oriented design principle in this course, and that is the single responsibility principle. It's often abbreviated as SRP, and this principle states that a class should only have a single reason to change. It should only know about one thing. Can you spot how many potential reasons the current design of the employee class may have for change? I think it's safe to say that it has at least three reasons. If the company's database implementation changes, all such classes containing database code would need to be modified. Requirement changes for report formats may result in modifying both XML and CSV methods of this class. This class is responsible for too many things. It's a big violator of the single responsibility principle. A close neighbor of the SRP is a popular acronym called DRY, D-R-Y, which stands for Don't Repeat Yourself. Keeping applications dry is more a best practice than it is an object-oriented design principle. However, keeping an application dry requires strict adherence to the single responsibility principle. A dry class would typically not contain any code that isn't its primary behavior. The code that prints reports should simply be elsewhere in another class that's better suited for that responsibility rather than duplicated in several different objects. In case of requirement changes, only a single place in the application code would require modification and we won't have to touch all those classes. Employees should not need to know or care about how they are printed. That's not their responsibility or concern. So, in light of what we have discussed so far, see if you can come up with a better design than our initial attempt. Take a moment to attempt an exercise on your own. Keep in mind that you will need to reduce the responsibility the employee class has and uh, delegate that responsibility to other classes. So your diagram should definitely contain more classes than what I've shown here. So please pause the video at this moment and try this on your own. And following that, we'll go over the design that I come up with. So here's my new design for the program. Now don't let this chart intimidate you. I know we jump from a single class to five classes. We'll go through them together step by step and finally implement this in Java. It'll be much clearer once we get there. But turn your attention to the new employee class. I've pulled out the methods for saving the employee to the database. I've also pulled out the methods for formatting reports. That responsibility now belongs to other objects, such as employee DAO and employee report formatter. We've reduced the responsibilities the employee object had. All classes in this chart now conform to the single responsibility principle. Each class now knows how to do only one thing. Employee Report Formatter class is responsible for formatting employee details. The Employee DAO class is responsible for saving and deleting employees in the database. By the way, the naming convention used here is quite common in the industry. DAO, D-A-O, stands for Data Access Object. So this class is responsible for data access operations specific to employee objects. The employee class is now just a POJO. In other words, just a basic Java class that will represent employee objects in our application. Now notice the two arrows pointing to the employee class. As I've mentioned in UML diagrams, arrows always point to the direction of dependency. So the employee report formatter depends on having an employee that it can format for reporting. We'll pass in that employee into the constructor as you'll see in the next lesson. Similarly, the employee DAO also depends on employee. It obviously needs an employee object to save or delete from the database. So we'll be passing employee objects as arguments to these methods. Now recall that these dependency relationships are also referred to as associations, but that's different from the relationship that we see here between the employee report formatter and the, and the report formatter. The employee report formatter class is pointing a solid arrow 
instead of the open arrows that we're used to seeing. And it's pointing that at the report formatter class. Solid arrows in UML represent inheritance relationships. The report formatter is a parent class, also referred to as a base class. The employee report formatter is a child of that class, specific to employees, and it inherits the formatting rules uh, and, and methods defined in its parent. So we'll actually be defining the default formatting rules in this parent report formatter, and its children will be able to use that functionality. The last class we can talk about here is the Database Connection Manager. This class is responsible for managing database connectivity. The Employee DAO class requires a database connection object to connect and execute database operations. So it requires this connection manager to hand it a connection object. This will all be much clearer once we implement this design using Java in the, in the next lesson, but database connectivity is not uh, the topic of this particular lesson. But in a nutshell, what I want you to take away from this is that these new classes are conforming to the single responsibility principle. And following SRP allows for proper separation of concerns. The employee object is no longer responsible for defining formatting rules or communicating with the database directly. We leave that up to the classes that are more capable and responsible for those kinds of behaviors. All right, so we're almost at the stage of implementing this in code, but before we do that, let's visualize this program once again from a higher level. Take a look at this image. This is almost the same as our previous one, but I tried to depict how our application will be used. Notice the long horizontal line above the yellow circle. This line separates the physical world from the software internals. The stick figure is the user, and the yellow circle here represents the physical device, such as a computer or a smartphone on which our application can potentially be running. Above this horizontal line, I've added a new class called Client Module. This class will serve as the entry point for our application. It'll instantiate the objects it needs based on the information the user will enter. In the coding exercises, we'll actually be defining our main method in this class to test out our framework by implementing functionality for hiring or terminating and printing reports. We'll actually define those methods in this class and test those out. So now it's time for the programming exercise. The task is for you to implement the design I've diagrammed here in Java code. For this assignment, you don't have to get bogged down with the details of a user interface or a real database connection or parsing XML or CSV formats. You can leave simple implementations for those using print line statements if you'd like. The single responsibility principle allows for a better separation of concerns. And this exercise is intended to provide you some practice on wiring this framework together so that you can see how separate objects can collaborate by sending messages to one another. And this will also serve as practice for implementing a UML class design like this into code. So try this out first and then proceed to the next video in which I present the solution as well as some helpful tips and techniques. I wish you good luck and I'll see you in the next lesson.